Welcome to Bench Warmers once again, and this week we are tracking the Jackrabbits here with Matt Zimmer from Argus Leader Media. What's going on, my man? I'm on vacation, and I came here to work with you. Awesome. Love it. Love the dedication. It's more like a staycation kind of thing. So We'll talk a little basketball and the uh, renovations at Frost Arena in Brookings coming up in a little bit, some football, but uh, everything right now, Zim, at SDSU, you talk about across the whole plethora of sports football, basketball, wrestling, almost everything is pretty good right now. It's almost at all ships rise kind of kind of situation, isn't it? Yeah, I, uh, I just wrote an article about that last week that, you know, the, the transition to Division One obviously has been pretty successful, and it's so far in the rearview mirror now, we probably shouldn't even be talking about the D1 transition. 08, before. right? Yeah. And we've gone, goes back to about then, yeah, 04, no, I 08, think, yeah, 04, 04, 04, I think was when Jack, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I think if you'd have told anybody, 20 years ago that this was how successful they were going to be in most sports, not just, you know, football, basketball, the big ones or whatever. Everyone would have been pretty happy with it. But this year in particular, I think you could make a pretty good argument that it was the most successful one they've had, that it's an, an all-time kind of year when you think about a football team getting back to the semifinals. Obviously, the men's basketball team, that's always the, the crown jewel. Do you get to the big dance yeah. in men's basketball? Yeah. And they did. Women fell a little bit short, but then they did the next best thing and won the NIT and won it in a way that almost no other program in the nation would with the attention that they got and the crowds they got and right. all that. Then you just factor in, you know, softball making their run and soccer, track and field, cross country. And, you know, uh, there, there really isn't any program sort of bringing up the rear. Um, it, it, every program there is, is in pretty good shape right now. And it's a testament to Justin Sell. I mean, that, that athletic department's in really good shape right now. All right. Uh, and you kind of become a victim of your own success. If you're the school with uh -huh. some coaches moving on, you have good teams for – couple three years and then Krista Wood in softball is an example of that uh -huh. two really good back-to-back -back seasons and then she goes to Creighton to take over the, the program there not a surprise there um, for a long time now in the last few years you've seen you know USD has lost some coaches in high profile sports and it hasn't happened to the Jacks as much right. a lot of people saying like how are they getting so lucky that they don't lose these these coaches like other programs do and it, it kind of they were kind of due and you look at football you know Jason Eck going on to be the head coach at Idaho and Brian Bergstrom going to be the head coach at Winona State now with, with what with what Krista Wood did um, and you know <clears throat> Eric I hate to you know scare any Jacks fans but Eric Henderson Aaron Johnson th those guys are are always candidates you know there's always going to be someone looking at those guys too so you're right it is a victim of your own success sort of thing and and now that's becoming maybe even more the case with players too because <laughs> obviously, you know, you see Baylor Shireman, player of the year, goes off, you know, enters the NBA draft, enters the portal. Now he's at Creighton, too. So um, that's something that I think is going to become a little bit more of their reality in the next few years. And, and that's probably something that I think Jacks fans and, and all fans at that mid-major FCS level are going to have to worry about a little bit. Um, but it's a good problem to have. It's better than being a program where no one's interested in your players and yeah. coaches. Yeah, probably more so players going forward than, than coaches maybe. Possibly. But And football, yeah, had a little more turnover than we've been used to with uh, Jason Eck. Taking Luke Schleisner with him mm -hmm. to Idaho, and then Bergstrom takes over at Winona State. But Jimmy Rogers still around to coach the defense. Zach Lujan, who played quarterback there a few years ago, Fan favorite. Everybody loves Zach Lujan, and he takes over the offense this year. He's kind of excited about that. Yeah, I think uh, certainly no disrespect to Zach. I think he's the perfect candidate, and he's done a nice job. He's coached the running backs, the quarterbacks. Um, but I think the biggest question for this program is going to be how are they going to handle that big of a, a, a chunk of their coaching staff being taken out? Yeah. Uh, Jason Eck had a, a, a obviously a very big role, not just the offensive coordinator, but the offensive line coach. And anyone who's followed the Jacks closely the last 10 years or so could tell you how big a difference he made coming in there and solidifying that offensive line, turning it into a, a, a dominant unit that can, you know, compare to North Dakota State yeah. and some of those yeah. other teams, that's going to be a big loss. And Zach Lujan, obviously super familiar with that program, was an excellent quarterback there, has worked his way up, but he's still only, what, like 25, 26 years old, and this yeah. is going to be his first time uh, calling the plays and being in charge of the offense himself. So there's definitely some questions there. I, I'd still feel good about it if I was a Jacks fan, but there's, there's, there's some questions there. Yeah, some old line turnover this year, and uh, yep. they're just getting into their eight-week summer camp here in the middle of June, but uh, we'll talk some more Jackrabbit football coming up on a later edition of Benchwarmers, but a uh, lot to be excited there. They start the season at Iowa, really tough road schedule this year for the Jacks as well. And as we mentioned, uh, when we come back, women's basketball won the WNIT this year. What can they do to follow up that? They're going to be loaded again. We'll talk to SDSU Women's Hoops when we come back. Thanks for watching Benchwarmers, presented by Avera Orthopedics.
Welcome back to Bench Warmers. Hanging out with uh, Matt Zimmer from Argus Leader Media and talking SDSU, uh, all things SDSU this week, and some women's basketball with the Jacks. Uh, just go back to the end of the regular season, and there was the debate of they didn't win the Summit League tournament. Mm -hmm. Should they have been in the NCAA tournament? Well, I don't think they had the resume. Right. You know, they had the one win over a ranked team. I believe it was UCLA who they ended up playing in the yeah. in the tournament. And UCLA had fallen out of the rankings. That was no longer as big of a win. They just didn't have the resume they've had in other years. So I think it's fair to say they didn't earn their way in. Um, but they also, just from the eyeball test and what we've seen from the Summit League teams in the NCAA tournament over the years, we all knew that they were one of the 64 best teams in the country. So whether they deserved it kind of depends on your definition of that, I guess. But they went out and proved it. You know? And then when you see that USD obviously went to the Sweet 16, uh, you know, knocked off Baylor, came close to the Elite Eight, then that kind of shows you, okay, SDSU you know, played that team very close, and, and if they're that good, then this, you know. Yeah. We know they're both worthy of being in the NCAA tournament just about every year. And we forget that the rest of the nation does not see us the way that we right. see us, which right. is a big part of that. And they I should have been I, it. I think people do, like, we, don't, we do get caught up in sometimes saying, like, well, they've proved themselves now. And I think they kind of have. Like, yeah. if you mention South Dakota or South Dakota State women's basketball, people, know. Uh, pe people are like, oh, yeah, those two schools are really good in women's basketball. But they still don't see them on the weekly basis like we do and understand just how good they are, how good some of those players are. You know, so I still think some people were surprised that USD made the run they did, that the Jacks made the run they did a few years ago when they went to the Sweet 16. Probably shouldn't be anymore. And uh, it's to SDSU's credit, and again, USD's credit too, when they did it, what, five, six, seven years ago mm -hmm. when they won the WNIT. You get into a tournament like that, that's your chance to show people, like, not only that, hey, we deserved it this year, but we deserve it every year. This is the caliber of program we are. And uh, you can see it in that NIT tournament, not to take anything away from the Jacks, certainly, but a couple of those teams, Minnesota in particular, like they did not want to be there. I mean, they were just like, why are we playing in the NIT? Let's get this thing over with. Whereas the Jacks are like, hey, this is a chance to keep playing, show that we belong in the NCAA tournament. They went out and played great. Their fans responded to it. I mean, that was a truly unique thing. Yeah. I don't know if there's maybe three or four other schools in the country that would have responded to the NIT the way South Dakota State as a university did. And it's just a... It's not the same as going to the NCAA tournament, but it's a it's a pretty nice consolation prize. That kid right there played fantastic in the entire tournament, Haley Timmer. But they go out, they beat Ohio, okay, beat them by 30 in the opening round. Here's that Minnesota game you're talking about. And they beat the Gophers by 21, just handled them. And it was just kind of that way through at least the thir uh, first three or four rounds. They go on and beat Drake, and then it got closer against Alabama and UCLA than in those uh, last couple of games of the tournament. Which is kind of what you... You'd want yeah, to see. it worked out well. You know, it yeah. worked out perfectly. They dominate those first two games, first three games. And that's kind of what I think gets everyone excited about it. Because at first you're like, okay, it's the NIT, you know, a little bonus basketball. Right. You right. know, you're kind of thinking the season's not quite over yet. But then when uh, it was the Alabama game, I think, where it was a close game at halftime, Alabama dominated the third quarter, which is usually the Jacks' quarter that they dominate. Looked like Alabama was going to win that game. Jacks roar back and, and find a way to win. And it was just so cool how at the end of each one of these games, you know, they would announce over the PA right after the game ended, we're going to be hosting yeah, again next yeah. week and the place would go nuts. And I mean, like I said, there's just not too many places that would treat that tournament that way. And I think once it was over and they won it, again, it's not the same as going to the NCAA tournament, especially for a program that you know is capable of winning a game or two in the NCAA tournament. Uh, but I thought uh, Terry Vandervek, my former colleague at the Argus Leader summed it up the best. He said, it's just another thing for this program to put on their resume. You don't have to compare it. Is it better than this or worse than this? It's just, hi, here's another thing we can say. We did this that year. We won this tournament. And it's, it's a 64-team yeah. national tournament that brought schools like Minnesota, Alabama, UCLA that normally wouldn't come to Brookings. And I think we both walked into the arena before the UCLA. That was the semifinal game and just looked around. And UCLA is there warm enough. You see the powder and blue jerseys. Awesome, and, yeah, 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 baby. Yeah, that was... It, that was really something. When, again, to, to not to always go back to when they made the move, but that's not the kind of thing you expected to yeah. see in 2004 when you're talking about, hey, we're going to Division One, we're joining this conference. You're like, cool, we're going to get to see, you know, IUPUI or all these <laughs> yeah. other schools, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, no one ever said the Minnesota Gophers are going to be coming to Frost Arena or UCLA Bruins, and seeing it was pretty cool. And I made the analogy once between the NCAA tournament and the WNIT is the NCAA. If you get snubbed by them, that's okay, but there's this other uh, more attractive, equally attractive person over here that, <laughs> that really wants you, and you go and you do that relationship, and it worked out great for USD those many years ago, and now for SDSU. So that I mean, to win that thing is is not easy either. So that's a big accomplishment. But uh, the Jacks graduate. Tylee Irwin finally finished up a fantastic career. Haley Greer, 
Uh, Addison Hirschman, Lauren Rongish, a couple of those seniors are gone, but the Jacks are going to be loaded again when they come back with Sellen and Burkhardt and all these players back. Paige Meyer will be back from injury. Mm -hmm. They're going to be really good. Yeah, we didn't even talk about Paige Meyer not even having who was arguably their second or third in that whole NIT run. In that whole run, yeah. Uh, they should be the favorites. I mean, no disrespect to USD, but they just graduated a tremendous class of seniors and Don Plitzewhite left. I still think USD will probably be the second best team in the league just because those two are so much higher than everyone else. But yeah, there's going to be, you know, whether you want to say pressure on SDSU or whatever, but they're going to be the team that should win it. You know, they've got, uh, you know, Maya Sellen, Peyton Burkhardt, you just mentioned some of the best players in the league. And players like Timmer and Maya are only going to get better, yeah. you know, because they're so young. So I, I think certainly NCAA tournament or bust, however you want to say it, and, and certainly I think there'll be a team that will have the expectation to, okay, once we make that tournament, if we do, make another run, try to win some games. And they added a grad transfer from Utah, yep. uh, Drew Gilton, who played at St. Thomas More in Rapid City, where Haley Timmer is from and was a great player there, mm -hmm. and went to, led the Pac-12 at Utah in assists. So they add her to all this, and uh, the SDSU women yeah, are going to be pretty loaded once they get to this upcoming season. All right, what about men's basketball? Uh, no Doug Wilson anymore. Baylor Shireman, well documented that he is gone. So uh, you add Matthew Moores and a couple other players. We'll talk about uh, SDSU men's hoops coming up next. Welcome back to Bench Warmers with Matt Zimmer this week talking uh, South Dakota State University and the SDSU Jackrabbit men's basketball team. Most wins they've ever had, 30 and 5 this last season, and uh, went to the NCAA tournament, lost to Providence, but uh, some celebration here from when they won the Summer League tournament. And this was, especially, I mean, at least by the numbers, their best season ever, was it not? I think you have to call it that, especially given that. It, they didn't go any farther than, or no other team has ever gone any farther. Um, but yeah, 30 wins and being the first team ever to run the table in the Summit League. You know, it's maybe easy to forget now because it's been in the rearview mirror for a while. That was a pretty big deal. And it kind of started being a, a thing that everyone was tracking throughout, you know, February. Like, can they do it? Can they run the table? Yeah. They didn't need to. You know, we knew they were going to be the number one seed in the conference tournament and, and be in Sioux Falls. And we knew they were the best team in the league. Uh, but I think some pressure started to mount the longer that streak started, you know, kept going. And then it start, you started thinking, because if you remember back before COVID and everything, the Jacks had kind of, you know, had some letdowns in the Summit League tournament. Altered for sure times. in the yeah, tournament. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly Mike Dom's senior year when they got beat in the first round, but even some, uh, you know, middle of the tournament losses. It had been a while since they'd, they'd been to the NCAA tournament. Um, so there was pressure. And then you run the table 18-0. and 0, It's like, okay, you, you accomplished this great thing that no one's ever done. Now you got to win three more. Yeah. And you know all those cliches about how hard it is to beat a team three times in one year. And they had to beat some good teams for a third time. And it, as you saw, it wasn't easy. Uh, but for them to finish that off and go 21-0, and 0, essentially, against the Summit League, uh, it was a tremendous year for them. You know, all sorts of accomplishments individually and as a team. The shooting statistics, how ridiculously good they were on offense. Um, I think that, that made it hard for them when they got to the NCAA tournament because they became this sexy pick that everyone thought was going to be an upset special and Providence was, just, was yeah. just too ready for them. And if you want to put a knock on anything, the Jack Rabbit men have still not won mm -hmm. an NCAA tournament game. As good as teams they've, have, they've had, still have not been able to accomplish that. And it's just, I don't think there's any specific reason for that or any fix for it necessarily. I mean, it's hard to win NCAA tournament games when you're a 13 or a 14 seed. Um, and that's one thing, I know I thought this year they would maybe be a 12 or even 11 and they ended up being a 13, I think. Um, they're going to have to start scheduling tougher non-conference non games. And that's tough to do because they're all going to be road games. You're not going to get anyone to come to Frost Arena. So then you have to balance, okay, do we want to spend all of November on the road and not play any home games? They're in a tough spot. It's a little tougher for the men than it is for the women. But some other schools in the Summit League have done it. We saw Earl Roberts make a run. North Dakota State has some wins under their belt. So, you know, it's great that they keep going back and that they've been to the tournament as many times as they have. But that's definitely a, a glaring yeah. omission from their resume right now. Yeah, like you said, everybody thought, oh, Providence, this is a great pick for us. Providence was really good. And it really man. wasn't a good matchup. I and think people just thought maybe that Providence isn't as big a name right. as some of those yeah. other schools, but yeah. they had six seniors. They won the Big East. I mean, that was not a good matchup yeah. for the Jacks. So Doug Wilson uh, graduates after a fantastic season. Noah Friedel has transferred to James Madison University out in Pennsylvania. Uh, David Winget is in the transfer portal right now. And uh, Baylor Shireman, of course, made the big news when he went into the NBA draft, or put his name in anyway, got an agent, ended up 
with all the NIL things going on, got some huge offers for some cash to go to different places, and he ends up at Creighton. And you talked to Eric Henderson a lot about this, and you can't blame Shireman for doing what he did, but it's just such a weird situation uh, right now in college basketball. Well, and again, this was something that SDSU hadn't had to deal with and some other schools in the Summit League had. You know, we've seen yeah. Matt Moody and Stanley Mude leave USD, and, and the Jacks hadn't had that happen. It finally happened to them, and that sucks for them. I mean, that's a big blow. When you think about how you were bringing Matthew Moores into that situation with Baylor Shireman, with all those other guys, Oh boy, I mean, that was going to be a loaded team that, yeah, was probably going to have a chance to win some NCAA tournament games. Still can, not saying they can't. Matthew Moore's is a, a big addition. But, yeah, losing Baylor Shireman like that, it, it's, it's difficult in a vacuum just in that he's a great player leaving this team. But, yeah, the, the greater implications are what does this mean for mid-major college basketball teams? You almost wonder – do we want to make sure the players we recruit and develop, we don't make them too good? Because if they get too good, you're going to lose them. So we're still waiting to see how the NCAA is going to deal with NIL and you know whether they're going to put some sort of restrictions on it or whether they can, you yeah. know, based on what we've seen in the courts and all those things. It's a really crazy time in the NCAA right now in college athletics. And for schools like South Dakota State and other mid-major, lower-level schools, it's a scary time because you don't know how that's going to affect you as these bigger schools look to sort of poach your players and coaches. Yeah, I mean, Zeke Mayo is a guy that's going to get into that situation probably eventually, but Mayo's coming back. Uh, Alex Arians, Matt Dentlinger will be in their sixth year, their COVID year now. Luke Apple's coming back, and then the Jacks add uh, six new guys. Here is uh, head coach Eric Henderson talking about the new guys, starting with Broden Lean, who was a red shirt last year. You know, obviously getting Broden off his redshirt year, he did a really good job in the weight room, um, you know, working with the scout team and really getting, getting confidence with his game. He has a great ability to stretch the floor. Um, he's got good moves with his back to the basket. He's really physically strong, good rebounder in there. So it'll be fun to see how we can, um, you know, fit Broden into the mix and, and see how he can impact our team. And then, uh, you know, then there's five, you know, fresh faces, obviously another red shirt in the South Dakota boy, Matthew Moores with, you know, his red shirt at Wisconsin. But, uh, you know, just an extremely talented player. But we talk about talent all the time. And, and, and maybe the most important thing to go along with talent is that selflessness. And he has that great ability to pass and make other people around him better. So he's going to make a huge impact for us. And, you know, the four freshmen, true freshmen, you know, probably the, the one that's closest to, to us, Kaylin Gary. Um, you know, obviously physically his body is terrific, has a great ability to shoot the three, plays extremely hard. Tanner Tesla from Boyden Hall, uh, just across the border in Iowa there. Really long, athletic, impacts the game in a lot of ways, can shoot it from deep, um, gets his hands on a lot of balls, and, and uh, you know, can make, you know, just those plays that, uh, you know, make a big difference in winning the basketball game. And so really looking forward to see how Tanner can impact uh, our team this year. Uh, the big kid from, from Bellevue, Nebraska, William Kyle, long 7-2 wingspan, really, really active around the rim, runs the floor really, really well, plays above the rim. And, you know, this, it takes a little longer for some of those bigger guys to adapt to the college level, but he's come in and done a tremendous job. And then the last guy, Jack Highstrider, I'll tell you what, really did a good job with his body his senior year in high school, put on some good weight, moving extremely well, stretches the floor, and, and uh, really is probably – you know, surprised us a little bit in his ability to impact the game. So really, really excited about all those fresh faces. All right, Maddie, a little bit more new than we're used to in the last couple of years, at least for the men, right? It's an athletic class. We'll see if they can shoot as well as uh, last year's yeah, team did. Yeah, the, the league country leaders last year in the shooting at SDSU men's. Jacks do have one scholarship left, by the way, that they still could bring in uh, somebody else before the season starts. I'm sure there's someone in the portal. And there will be a new arena to play. And eventually, we'll take a look at uh, the work that has started on Frost Arena in Brookings when we come back. Bench Warmers on Midco Sports, presented by Avera Orthopedics. Welcome back. Frost Arena in Brookings turns 50 years old coming up next year in 2023. Plans are in motion for the renovation there on the new First Bank and Trust Arena that will be on the same spot. Here is Jeff Holm talking about how things are progressing right now. We're in step one, and so if you, if you call it three steps, we're in step one. This first summer is a lot of work that the general public won't see. It's the understructure. We're doing things underneath the, what the bleachers currently are on the second floor. They'll become permanent uh, chairbacks, 
they're doing the understructure of that right now. So people won't see a ton of that going on other than a bunch of, uh, of uh, vehicles going in and out of the building. We will take probably what people will notice the most, the southeast huge exterior stairs. They're gonna come out probably in about two weeks. They'll come out and so that's how they'll access the building and get around in that first floor. So a lot of first floor stuff will be done this uh, summer. Step two will be next summer as soon as the basketball season is over they'll come back in and then they will start working on those permanent seats in the second level. Step three will be the, the following summer so the summer of 2024 and they'll work on the the third level which will be a suite level and there's some party decks up there on that third floor and then the ground floor with the gym and the telescopic new telescopic chair back bleachers so in a nutshell 30,000 foot view that's where we're at first summer under structure stuff second summer second level we'll we'll get that complete third summer the su the suite level and uh, uh, party deck level along with the first floor all right, Jimmy, it's going to be exciting. You're going to miss the old arena, I know, but... Uh, I will a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Little, little parts and pieces of it. All right, appreciate it. Enjoy your staycation. And Thanks for having me. We'll see you in Brookings uh, later on this year. When we come back, a little peek ahead to what's coming up next week on Bench Warmers. Our thanks to Avera Orthopedics and thanks this week to Matt Zimmer from Argus Leader Media. Next week on Bench Warmers, David Brown is our guest talking Augustana hockey and the NSIC.